Hi, I'm Jules van Binsbergen, a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm Jonathan Burke, a finance professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we are going to talk about private debt. And we want to understand why in recent years, private debt is gaining increasing traction. Lots of people are talking about it as a way to finance companies. And we want to understand both what private debt is and explore that in this episode, and also try to get a sense of where the trend comes from. Why was private debt not that popular before? And why is it so popular now? Maybe we should start out, Jules, by first of all, explaining what private debt is. I mean, the way many large companies are financed using public debt, which means they issue debt and individual bondholders buy the debt. So they have many people, many investors buying the debt. And often these investors are institutions like pension funds. Private debt is a slightly different model. What happens is you have a fund that raises money from investors and then invests in the debt of a company. So rather than individual investors investing directly in the company, they invest indirectly through a money management fund that invests in a company. Indeed. And so generally people do not count bank debt, which is the debt that firms raise from other financial institutions such as banks as part of private debt. So private debt is a separate model from getting loans from a bank, say. And so if we take one step back, Jonathan, and we think about what are all the various ways in which a company can finance itself, then we have in previous episodes spoken about public equity markets, which is that investors can invest and be co-owners of the firm through publicly traded shares. We have had episodes dedicated to private equity, where investors can, through private markets, invest in the ownership of a firm. And we had Eric Zinterhofer on to talk about what the advantages are of using private equity versus public equity. But then you can also decide to fund part of your company with debt. And as we just indicated, there are many different types of debt that in principle you could use. And so the three types that we've discussed so far is the debt that you could raise from public market by issuing bonds. So as a company, you could issue corporate bonds and you get, as you said, fractional, smaller investors that buy those bonds. You can have private debt, which is that a fund raises money from investors and then gives you a loan as a fund. And then we have bank debt, which is that a bank decides to give you a loan under certain conditions. So the, I think the puzzle here is, as far as private equity is concerned, when we spoke to Eric Zinterhofer, Private equity seems a distinct advantage. The people who have private equity have control of the corporation. And when you have a large equity holder who has control, he has a huge incentives to make sure the corporations run well. The problem is debt holders don't have control rights. And so the same argument can't be applied to private debt, which raises a question. Why then should you see private debt? Well, so let's just go in steps here. You can imagine that in financial distress, it'd be easier to work out an efficient solution with private debt versus public debt. We have an episode talking about financial distress, but it's worth thinking about it again. Imagine a company that has only one debt holder and the company goes into financial distress. Then in financial distress, there's only one guy there, and the company can be reorganized along the interests of that one person. When there are multiple debt holders, those multiple debt holders may have different interests. And specifically, a junior debt holder is likely to have a different interest than a senior debt holder. In other words, imagine a company that's in financial distress, and if it were to go bankrupt, the senior debt holders would get paid. It's only the junior debt holders that would take a loss. Well, in that situation, the senior debt holders are fine with the bankruptcy. They know they're going to get paid. And the junior debt holders are the ones who want to avoid bankruptcy at all costs. And so therefore, if you have to make concessions to avoid bankruptcy, the junior debt holders are going to be more willing to make those concessions than the senior debt holders. And we have this conflict of interest between debt holders, which can lead to inefficient outcomes. If you have only one debt holder, you don't have that. 
And so what private debt might have this advantage where there are fewer debt holders and it's easier to work out the case when the firm goes into financial distress. Of course, the problem with that is banks seem to have the same advantages. So let's think a little bit about what private debt could have as an advantage over banks, right? And so why do we see this recent trend in private debt compared to bank debt? And I think that there are a couple of potential explanations. The first one is one of the strengths of banks used to be what we call relationship banking, which is the idea that banks have a close relationship with their customers that allows more intimate sharing of information, which allows for more tailored solutions and therefore an easier lending relationship than you would have with, say, a public market. But uh, if due to, say, regulation or other issues, banks are no longer investing in relationship banking as much, it could be that there's an underserved part of the debt market that now the private debt providers are jumping into. So one explanation for why that segment is underserved by banks could indeed be, particularly since the financial crisis, I would say, the fact that banks are much more heavily regulated. And when you more heavily regulate banks, we get what is called the shadow banking sector, which is essentially firms that are trying to emulate the activities that banks do. But because they're not officially banks, they're not regulated as such. And so there is regulatory arbitrage. They have an advantage, regulatorily speaking, over banks. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, when I think of banks, I think of they've kind of made a devil's deal, right? In return for all the subsidies, the government says there's some businesses they can't take as much risk in or they can't operate in. And so you might imagine that when banks are now optimizing, given the government subsidies, they may move resources around that creates opportunities for other entities to enter. And perhaps that's the reason why we've seen a growth in private debt, that basically banks, given the world that they live in, given the subsidized world they live in and the regulation, don't find it as profitable to compete in this space. And an unsubsidized, unregulated entity would actually find it more profitable. No, and it's also true, I think, that the number of banks that are serving the market has been reduced also since the financial crisis. And so the question is, whether therefore the amount of intermediation that banks are doing is not growing that fast and therefore there's room for the private debt markets to jump into that side. But I do think that there's another important difference, Jonathan, and it actually relates to one of the episodes that we did before. When we talked about the recent banking failures and the issues that banks could have, we talked about these subsidies and we talked about deposit insurance. And one thing we argued for was that it might be worth considering having what's called narrow banking. And narrow banking implies that the money that banks get from depositors, they can only invest that in a safe way so that the deposit insurance is not that binding in the sense that the investments are so safe that you don't even really need deposit insurance. But that did mean that the risky lending activities will just have to be done by people that are not enjoying deposit insurance. And of course, private debt funds are exactly that. You just have investors that give money to the funds and the funds invest this in debt claims of companies. And if those companies fail, then the investors are fully on the hook. There's no government to bail you out. There's no deposit insurance that is going to give you your money back. So it is an exact transfer of risk from the risky companies to the underlying investors. Yeah. I mean, it's not only the risk, it's also the liquidity, right? So the thing about banks is they finance long-term investment, business loans, with short-term deposits. And so that's what they call liquidity transformation, but it has this very risky profile because the people who are financing these long-term investments can take their money out at any time. And so we solve that problem by basically having deposit insurance and subsidies for banks. The private debt market is we get rid of all of that. The investors in the debt fund know they're tying up the capital for a long period of time. And then because the capital is tied up, they can make long-term investments. And that obviously is a more efficient market in the market for banks. But you might say to me, well, wait a minute, Jonathan, with a government subsidy, doesn't the bank have an advantage? Well, it does because of the subsidy, but with the subsidy comes a lot of regulation that ties banks' hands. And because of that tied, you might imagine that they aren't able to nimbly take advantage of certain segments. And perhaps that's the reason why the private market moves in 
and fills those segments. So one more thing, though, Jonathan, when we talked to Eric Zinterhofer about private equity, he made one very clear point. And he said, listen, if the market capitalization of the company is under a billion, it's exactly in a range where it's tough to be publicly traded. And so you could easily imagine that something similar holds for debt claims, meaning that if you are not large enough as a company, maybe it's just not that easy to access public debt markets and have corporate bonds traded. And so if we now combine that fact that you cannot access the debt markets when you're not large enough, and you combine that with banks taking a step back due to all the regulatory issues we just discussed, it does seem that there's a clear opening here for private debt markets to move in. Okay, Jules. Well, we have a lot of questions here, a lot of possible explanations, but I don't think we have a lot of answers of exactly why private debt has grown. So at this point, let's introduce our guest. Our guest is Lawrence Gottlieb. Lawrence is the chairman, chief executive officer, and co-founder of Fundamental Advisors, which invests in private debt. He has focused his career on revitalizing distressed assets and businesses. Lawrence, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jonathan. It's wonderful to be here. It's great to have you, Lawrence. Thank you. So, Lawrence, there are a couple of questions we wanted to ask you about, particularly in the context of the recent increase in interest in private debt. And so, both Jonathan and I have taught finance for a long time, and I think often we've talked about private equity in class, but it's not often that we talk about private debt. So, the question is, why recently is there this increased interest in this topic? What do you think drives this interest? I hear what you're saying. I appreciate the question. And the first thing I'd like to do is describe the context of the space of time I'm referring to, which really moves all the way back to Dodd-Frank and increased regulation in traditional lenders and money center banks through the present day. So looking at that period of time, what I believe we have seen is certainly beyond interesting progress in equity markets. However, and most recently, this is jarring. Most recently, you have seen a huge uptick in equity markets. But if you isolate where that came from, it's down to only a few equities. It's maybe six or eight or 10 tech heavy names that have been chosen as winners. And that's where the performance comes from, while other segments of the market haven't underperformed, but certainly have not performed at the level of those stocks that I've just mentioned. Meanwhile, during that same space of time, you see steady and true performance in private credit markets, an expansion of those markets, and really interesting developments in terms of specialized lenders with knowledge about the industries that they're lending into, who are able to perform in a steady way that I think is attractive to a whole host of different types of investors. So yes, there's been performance in the equity markets, but you really have to open the lens and look where, look at where that's occurred. Whereas in private credit markets, there's been expansion in the range of products, expansion in the number of managers, specialization, and consistent delivery of attractive returns. That would be my take on things. So, Lawrence, in a more general sense, we think about private equity as having this great advantage because the private equity holders have a great incentive to govern the corporation and take an interest in the corporation. In public equity, those incentives are much lower. Now, the extent to which debt holders don't govern the organization, what's the advantage then of private debt, given that it's not as liquid? So you have a few different concepts in that question, which I'll address. I'll try to get to each of them one at a time. First, private equities, in my opinion, most terrific advantage or asset is its structure. Private equity has longer duration and allows and manages the growth of the concerns or the operating businesses into which it invests. The force of quarterly reporting and quarterly targets that's put upon public equities, in my view, can be very constraining, particularly for early growth of businesses. Private equity can have an earlier and longer view. Now let's talk about debt. Private debt 
in the case of what we do, does in fact have covenants, leads, first lanes, traditional sort of mom and apple pie characteristics that we like that allow us to manage risk. But we get that in exchange for having to be expertized and deliver valuable capital to debt markets that wouldn't be served by traditional money center banks or other allocators, et cetera. They're specialized. We must have specialized knowledge of renewable energy, healthcare assets, et cetera, which allows us to get comfortable. We do ask for those covenants of governance in return, and we ask for increased yield. But those borrowers happily take our capital because they believe that the equity value that they can achieve while borrowing with us far outstrips the cost of our debt or the burdens of our debt. So are you saying that there's involvement of private debt holders in the company too, at least to some extent? Or would you even say as much as private equity companies are involved in the actual running of the company? Absolutely not. I, I didn't mean to be misunderstood in that way. What I mean is private debt, as we understand it, comes with traditional debt covenants and restrictions and liens. And that gets us comfortable from a credit perspective while giving governance, ordinary governance, while that debt's performing, entirely to equity. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. So there's this concept of economics of signaling. So let's say I'm a good guy and I want to signal I'm a good guy. One way I could do that is I accept lots of covenants because I know the bad guy wouldn't be able to accept those covenants. So by accepting those covenants, I'm signaling I'm a good guy. And, and giving me comfort to lend to you. Exactly. And so is that the sense at which if I'm borrowing, I want to go to Lawrence because I know he's informed and everybody else knows he's informed and he's going to put those covenants on. But in that sense, I'm signaling I'm a good guy. And so I'll get a better deal from Lawrence than I would in public debt where I'd be pooled with the bad guys. Sure. You'll get a quicker deal. You'll probably get more flexibility. You'll get the ability to return to us for all different types and stripes of capital. You're betting on our knowledge, our specialized knowledge of the industry. Whereas in public markets, first of all, you may be a, a younger or newer or mid-stage company for which public markets are not available. And as I mentioned previously, uh, much of the public debt now is routinized or constrained by larger forces where a more nimble firm like us could be more bespoke and tailor a solution to exactly to what you need. So if we think back, this specialized lending business used to be the purview of banks particularly, right? It was their business model that they would really know their client, they would really know their industry. And so what is it about private debt that they have as an advantage over this banking model? Now, you did mention Dodd-Frank earlier. So is there a role for regulation here that explains that? Or, or what do you think drives that advantage over that more traditional model? Because generally, when people talk about private debt, they don't mean bank lending. They mean the other part of private debt. That's right. I would start with knowledge, understanding, underwriting, experience in specialized industries. So that is the asset or the knowledge. That knowledge base allows private lenders of all shapes and sizes. And by the way, there is a range. Our firm does smaller instruments, 20, 50, $100 million instruments, where we have lots of flexibility. As you get into larger, perhaps pooled loans, whole loans, certainly into the ABS markets, et cetera, there's more structure and more rigor. That might be for the better, it might be for the worse, depending on your perspective. What I would say is, Private credit in its smaller, more bespoke way that I think about it is really a lifeblood to smaller, medium-sized companies, one that can't access the bigger credit markets, the traditional ones that you described, banks for sure they can't access. And even some of the ones that I just described, they're not yet ready for. This isn't multi-hundred million dollar or billion dollar tranches of pool debt. Instead, these are smaller solutions catered to the needs of the borrower, to the company. Lawrence, do you think we're going to see what happened in equity? I mean, the growth of private equity has been phenomenal. And so 
Are we going to see the same thing with private debt? Is, are we going to move away from public debt to the extent that we saw in private equity? I think in many ways that question has been answered. More and more, even larger firms, all different types of companies are accessing what we would call alternative or private debt markets. Look, in some ways, public debt markets, you know, I, I guess our dad all told us the same joke. The only person the bank ever wants to lend money to is the guy who doesn't need the money, right? So the public debt markets have in some way constrained themselves in such a way that they have pushed the borrowing base into our laps. Now, if you're asking me whether there's going to be a hockey stick growth for those markets in the future, there's been over the last decade or so. Will it continue? I believe it will. And I don't think there'll be any reversal by the big lenders to address themselves to these smaller loans, smaller markets, more needy, bespoke customers. I guess my, my answer to your question, Jonathan, is yes. I believe there'll be continued growth here. When we're thinking about the rise of private equity and the challenges that private equity is facing at this point, right? one of the things that was brought up in that conversation we had with Eric Zinterhofer was that now that interest rates are higher, private equity has a tougher time levering up the investments that they have. And so my question was, do you think that the recent rise of private debt relative to private equity may have something to do with the rate environment that we're currently seeing, which is somewhat higher than what we had a couple of years ago? I think there's certainly some correlation to exactly how much is difficult to quantify. But I do think that, first of all, there will be a return to traditional private equity buyout firms using all different forms of financing, including private credit and traditional credit to lever up companies. Certainly as we look forward to a more normalized rate environment, I don't know exactly what that is, but call it a couple hundred basis points away from where we are now as a target, You'll see an increase in that activity. I think that will be met with an increase of activity of all kinds, more private equity, more private debt. That's probably what you'll see, a hotter market all around. That's my guess. So, you know, the unemployment numbers came out yesterday or the day before. And when I was looking at the state of the economy and how well the economy is doing, I was thinking to myself, why? I mean, I think we can all agree that in the last eight years, leadership in this country has not been exemplary. You know, you look around, you don't see anything special about the world. And yet the economy has just been impervious. It has just, we've done exceptionally well. How much of that do you think has to do with the reorganization of financing markets, the growth of private equity, the growth of private debt, and the efficiency gains that you get from people like you providing the capital? First of all, I couldn't agree more with your observation. We have been starved for leadership, not just in this country, but I would argue in the Western world. Point to a leadership regime that is well-loved by its constituents. It, it's hard to. Why has the economy been resilient? It's a great question. Some may argue, well, we still are the giant among midgets, meaning alternatives to investing here in the United States are flawed. You have limited options. I used to answer this question by saying, we did certain things so well and so much better than anyone else that it's hard to compare. For example, financing the upstart of new companies, innovation, bringing companies public to the public markets, debt capital markets broadly, the availability of debt of any kind. I used to be able to say, look at that list. There's nowhere else in the world. By the way, all the way to restructuring. Our restructuring practice here in this country is so innovative by comparison to others, allowing firms to continue on during difficult times. I used to say we really have no parallel. I want to believe that's true today, but I don't believe we can survive an unmanaged space of time like the one we've seen. We just have been starved for leadership. I lament that. I, I'm a huge concern around that. I think we, in some ways we've succeeded in spite of ourselves with various policy decisions that we've made. Now, I, I don't want to get too political, but we need to be mindful of these things.
So something that Jonathan probably was driving at too was that private markets are potentially a way to try to get away from the imposed regulation that might otherwise be stifling growth, right? So one of the reasons why we're seeing movements from public markets into private markets, do you think that that's partly driven by the desire to escape regulation? Would that be fair? I guess the extreme example of that, Jules, would be the crypto markets where that's the, the whole goal. Look, I actually think people welcome regulation where regulation is designed for a protective purpose and it's managed in such a way that's amenable to the growth of business. That's kind of the foundation of the United States. Since the 33 Act, we've had all kinds of rigor here that gives comfort to investors from around the world to park their assets and launch their businesses here. The balance has changed. We don't have some God-given right to be the only place where innovation and complex finance could be achieved. And so I don't think we should behave that way. I think we should continue to be a platform for businesses to grow, for financial firms to finance those businesses, and if you'll allow me to continue, for folks to educate their kids and for folks to feel safe. Uh, and by the way, let's build some infrastructure too. <laughs> yeah, but you know, Lawrence, one of the things that I would say transformed the world, but certainly America, is the idea that capital is not in short supply. And what that means is that intermediaries exist that make it very easy for capital to find good investment opportunities. And the extent to which our markets are organized that way. I think contributes enormously to the growth and the state of the economy, despite the fact that we have poor leadership. Yes. Well, Lawrence, that was a really interesting interview. I have to say it brought up many issues that I think require much more in-depth discussion. I've enjoyed it. If I could be helpful on these or any other topics, I'm always here for you. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcasts. We love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcasts. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal Podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by University FM.